I think there's a question in the center um, over here. Uh, if you could talk about the relationship between fear and risk and passion and failure in these experiences. In, <laughs> yeah. Um, fear and risk um, always come after your passion, I guess. I mean, it's, if you're passionate about something, there's always going to be an element of fear and there's always going to be an element of risk. Um, I guess for me, when you know, kind of undertaking adventures, you know, I remember being in, going up to the Arctic, and I was in, um, right, sitting in a little room waiting to get clearance to go, and I, my brain was kind of like the what ifs, the what ifs, and the fear became consuming, and I was like, you know, what if, what if, what if, and then you get out there, and when the what if happens, you're so in the moment, the adrenaline takes over, the moment takes over, um, and so you just live it, and it just and it becomes something. I think that was like in the project when stuff starts to go wrong, you just you're passionate about it, and you know you want to get somewhere, and that then eradicates the fear and and lets other things percolate through. That's Did you discern why people want to surf waves that rip their femurs? <laughs> well, I, I, the, the question that it gets asked all the time is, are they insane? And actually, Laird thinks it's insane to sit in an office all day. That's, you know, so I think everything's relative. And it's not like they don't feel fear. I mean, if you see a 70-foot wave, there's something wrong with you if you don't feel fear. It's, it's what you do with it. And um, you know, fear is really a kind of energy that is, I guess, aims towards us surviving. So I think that a lot of the times we think of fear, we think of it as something to be avoided. Um, but I think fear is just another experience that you're going to have in pursuit of your passion. Ellen, uh, this question was asked repeatedly uh, after your presentation. Um, what, what is it that you need? What is it that I need? Should, should I take my wallet out? <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> We need <laughs> awareness. Rhetoric is not enough. David and I were just talking about this backstage, that we're losing things we don't have time to be playing with here. Losing species, losing big cats, losing wildlife, losing anything that's valuable to us and alive in this world, we're not getting a second chance here. It's not a, it's not a company that goes bankrupt. It's not an idea or an experiment that goes wrong and we get a do-over. There are no do-overs here. We're not going to have a do-over with the tigers. We've already lost a huge proportion of its genome. We're really risking losing the natural tiger as we know it. People, I've been very impressed with this meeting, with this, with this conference. I've never been to a conference like PopTech in my life. And I think it's been well worth my while coming here because somehow the ideas have to disseminate through the world, well beyond the conservation world. The conservation world, which in my mind has been tasked with saving our Earth's resources, is not doing it. Is not doing it. We are failing. And part of why we are failing is because you're letting us fail. That the outside world is letting it happen and even rewarding it to some extent. Mm -hmm. Don't reward failure. Don't give to organizations which are not showing you that they are really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Look at people who are scaling up in the right way. Go to our website, panthera.org, because I would never have taken this initiative on unless I felt that maybe we can try a different paradigm. Maybe we could do it in a way that really means something. We will do it. It's not maybe. It's just a matter of if there's enough life energy in the people working with me. So how could you help beyond giving money? If you give money, do not give it easily. Do not let go of your, your dollars easily. Don't let go of your time easily. Make sure you're working with or giving to the organizations who are really making a difference. That's the only thing I could say. Echoes of Ned's earlier remarks. Let's go over here. Hi, Jack. Um, question about the valley of death between awareness and action, and how to bridge that. It was thought for many years in the environmental movement that if we just created awareness, if we had a tsunami, a huge thousand foot wave of awareness moving across the, the society, we get action. But now we've shown that actually that's not the case. In fact, the thousand foot wave of, say, climate change awareness seemed to have hit a wall and now is bouncing back. So maybe, David, you can start. But just your thoughts about how to really get past this and say, you know what? Awareness is absolutely critical, super critical. But what's that next piece now to build that next piece of the bridge? 
You know, it's, it's an incredibly good question. I think, you know, we have got to a point where, I was saying earlier, the list of solutions outweigh the list of problems. And, you know, the, the, the big problem with the climate change debate is someone put the word debate on there. And we were talking about this earlier. It's undeniable species loss, topsoil erosion, deforestation. So what we need to do is go in and pinpoint, knowing that we are the people who are starting these problems, go in and figure out. I mean, let's take plastic, for example. The plastic bag is a totally pointless, planet point one zero dumb product. We can stop it today. But we've got this massive headwind coming from industry who have invested a huge amount of money into a system that is going to fail. And as consumers, we hold the power over those industries. We are the ones who make decisions. So we have to start activating ourselves on those small wins. I would love to see us start just ticking things off. We've gone, we want to save the world. Let's save the world. Well, let's eradicate the plastic bag. Let's stop the destruction of rainforest so the big cats don't have a home to live in. And to do that, I think we have to really quantify you know, processes for impact and say, this is the company that is responsible for doing X, Y, and Z. This is the process. This is the actions, all the way back to the consumer. Because to create systemic change, you need governments, businesses, and consumers. But it can happen. We've seen it. We saw it with, you know, in the oceans with tuna. It was a great example. 1986, a Greenpeace activist filmed the tuna being caught up in a net before the web, before Twitter, before these distribution networks. He, he put it up, shot a video. Consumers reacted out of control. They were like, "This, I don't want Flipper to get nailed. This is unbelievable, right? All of a sudden, supermarkets went, whoa, we're guilty. They had to react. Next thing that happened was governments realized that they had to legislate against long line netting. So you have this systemic change happening through those three areas. So I think that, that their solutions are definitely there. We have to pinpoint the quick wins. And let's get some wins under our belt, rather than just saying, yo, we're going to save the world today, all in one go. So that would be my, my little 10 cents. I'm sure you guys have some thoughts on that. I, I, you know, one question that's kind of related to that that I was thinking a lot about because somebody asked it is, you know, do, will we ever understand these exactly what to do or how it all, the intricacies of all of it? And, and I think that there, we, in order to have, have even a chance, what we're going to have to do is be a lot more creative in our approaches. And, you know, it, it, maybe it does come down to design in a lot of cases or just choices. We're going to have to be a lot more intrepid and um, be willing to do things that possibly, you know, that we haven't done before. And we're going to have to be, I think we're going to have to have more humility. And I think that's what you were talking about. It's like we, you know, it's not okay for us to be responsible for the sixth global mass extinction. We're not that much more important than everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that to me is a real sea change in thinking. And, and I guess the real question is, you know, are we willing to do that? Storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we need more of. It's what we based on. It's why we're here. We're sharing stories, and we need to take those stories and do something with it and go out there. I mean, it's, you're an instigator, Andrew, right? Yeah. You know, it's why you create the institutes, why you create, you know, taking stories. And we, we're all storytellers. And if we can go back to that and help take those stories to just help us unlearn and relearn. We created the planet when we had infinite resources and cheap fuel. Yeah. And we went, woo, look at us. We're a great species. You know what else? And now we don't. We know that. You know, people ask about what I came to the conclusion. I asked every scientist, "Are the waves getting bigger as a result of climate change?" And, and my contention in the end was, we are headed for a stormier, more aquatic world. And every scientist agreed with that. It was just a question of what it would actually look like because it was so complicated, and there's all these feedback loops that nobody quite gets. But the notion basically was, you know, we that that the climate is changing. It doesn't matter what we think about it. It's so much bigger than we are that the, the real question is, what are we going to do about it? One, one scientist said to me, if, if it just keeps going like this, we're going to have to top off dikes. We're going to have to you know, change the way we build ships, all of that. And we do know that the oceans have been 120 feet higher before. So it's not a question of, hey, let's, let's all sit and talk and debate about it. It's, it's happening. Yeah. But it's, not, it's, it's, it's very difficult for the human race to to think on a scale in the future when we can't even think at the proper scale right now. We're not even dealing with the issues which we have to be dealing with at the scales we have to be dealing at now. The awareness does not necessarily translate into action. Action equals action. Mm -hmm. People say, well, what good are zoos? And everyone will say to you, oh, but zoos educate. Well, actually, there are almost no studies showing zoos do anything in terms of true environmental education that makes a change in people's life. There probably is not a person in this room who has not been to a zoo at some point in the, their life. If zoos made a difference, we wouldn't have any 
wildlife problems, frankly. Just awareness is, is not enough. Do not be fooled by that. Awareness has to translate into action. Action can be at different levels, but only action is action. And on that note, because we are out of time, please give a hearty round of applause again. Thank all of you, Susan, Alan. Thank you very much.